Thank you, Alex. So uh, this afternoon we've got something a little bit different, but with a title like this, I'd like to start off to say, well, uh, what, we're, uh, what we're not talking today about is uh, bad geography and bad media. Now, there's plenty of it, and we could probably do a talk on it all itself because it's quite humorous, whether it's uh, uh, politics uh, within a country, between countries, and the slight displacement of other countries, uh, old countries that no longer exist anymore, or uh, slightly misplacing them geographically. It's pretty common in media that they get it wrong, and often it's, well whether it's intentional or competence becomes a completely different question, particularly when you look at, you know, bastions of integrity and journalistic knowledge and accuracy like the sun. Um, we see a lot of problems, but misinformation is a real problem today with maps because maps are such a visual cue. People believe them because they tell them stories. But to see where we are today, I just want to step back in history a little bit. So where we see maps in the media, we see it all the time. It's everywhere, um, you know, government media, publications, corporate media, social media is particularly the becoming such an increasingly influential way people consume knowledge. And, you know, what are we, what are we looking at? We're looking at all types of, uh, you know, different things. And, you know... Hold on just a second. Yep. I'd like to interrupt. Okay. I'm not, not loud enough? Uh, it's just, it's sort of going up and down. Okay. Oh, no worries. All right, so, you know, we can see, a, a, you know, an interesting political map here, but uh, it seems like uh, New Zealand's taken a wander west somewhere. <laughs> so whether this map's accurate or not is really up to interpretation. Um, we can look at these things and then say, well, where did we come from in relation to this? You know, can we, can we believe the maps we see? So, you know... Did we come from dis intentional deception or is it merely incompetence? You know, we look at old maps where it's uh, Hicks Sunt Draconis, here be dragons. Why would they put that on a map? Well, they don't know what was there and the guys who went missing probably got eaten by a dragon. Uh, in other cases, we see just poor, poor cartography with Island California or we see people being intentionally misleading through the use of trap streets, things to add to a map to prove your providence that you created it because you're lying to people. The, uh, the, the actual, oh, sorry, oh. The, uh, the name itself there of lie close tends to give it away. <sighs> but these things are becoming obviously less common within um, the maps we see and read and therefore we tend to trust them more because, hey, if it's on Google, it's got to be accurate, right? Well, that's, uh, that's another thing. But... Maps have always been used to tell stories. Early maps that told stories were, in some instances, propaganda. This is a map of the road to heaven and hell, uh, influencing your behaviour, an allegorical story, using the idea of a, literally a road one place or another based on your behaviour. As society moved from a very religious to a more secular um, <coughs> Uh, bent, we see a change in how the maps tell stories for us. So, um, you know, the propaganda, the influence of your thoughts and therefore your behaviours moves from personal behaviours to enforcing political agendas. Um, the use of fear as a tool. So this is a 1914 map from uh, Germany. So it's showing... Germany and the, the Triple Entente in the centre and their enemies, you know, France, Britain, Russia falling before them. So that's one of these things. It's, it's pushing that patriotic message. It's meant to influence you to be more positive to what's happening, which is, at quite admittedly, absolutely terrible times. But, you know, you shouldn't be afraid because we're going to win. Now, this isn't the first uh, sort of this type of political map. We have an example here of another early propaganda map. This is anti-secessionist propaganda from uh, the United States Civil War. It's called um, Traitors and Tyrants. It's about the fragmentation, the, the fear of fragmentation, balkanisation of the United States because of the secession of the Confederacy. You have 
these different blocks here, the Atlantic states, the in internal states, the Western states. But in addition to this balkanisation, they include external threats, Canada, and other powers, so Spain and, and, and Mexico. And I mean, I can understand why Canada, I mean, it's like, it's not like 40 years before the, they came in and burned Washington or anything. <laughs> so, but that's part of motivating this fear, this thought of if we are separate, we're vulnerable. That's, this is playing in that, entering that playground of the imagination and using that to tell a story and to change behaviours and perceptions within the viewer. And another example here from, from, from World War I. This one was just after the 1917 French um, uh, mutiny. And it's showing the risk of Prussia as, and its tentacles of influence all throughout the world. They were, you know, it was pretty awful times. And, you know, the, the, the quote from Marshal Patan down the bottom, you know, um, Sorry, I can't read it from here, but, uh, you know, uh, basically, if we don't defend ourselves and our liberty, you know, nothing can save us, you know, from the, from the German military machine. So this was meant to reinforce and encourage the people to still believe in what was, you know, obviously awful, awful situation. But this is very obvious propaganda. It began to change after the Second World War, particularly with the development of disinformation. This was a specific strategy developed by the, uh, the GPU, who were you know, predecessors of our friends at KGB. Essentially, black propaganda to subtly influence politics, decision-making, and similar things. So, you know, it's not necessarily 100% wrong, but it's going to make you doubt. It's going to make you maybe change your mind about things and be influenced towards something that is more amenable to the people who are doing that type of propaganda. You know, there's, there's multiple reasons for it. Uh, you know, the biggest thing is the intention to deceive, but, you know, whether it's mili mi bleh, military, party political, you know, sectarian or religious divides, and they can often cross into the political as well, um, you know, conspiracy theorists, and I'll say enough of that, but also, uh, you know, anti-intellectual anti and anti-science agendas, changing these messages. And these are really, really, really important things um, when we think about, okay, what are the stories, the maps we're seeing telling us? What are the stories we are creating? And is there a chance they might be misused? Now, a lot of work's been done in the area of disinformation. What does it mean? How's, how does it spread? What's, you know, what are the factors that influence it? So we're looking at, you know, so we've got disinformation here, we've got, you know, all these little factors around it. Um, extremely, extremely complex stuff. And the people who, who do this sort of stuff are, are, not, are not stupid. I mean, it's an art. You know, this, the definitions here come from ACMA, Australian Communications Media Authority, talking about the ways that they see it and particularly, obviously, towards regulated commercial media. But it also applies very much to, to social media, which is a, an increasing channel not only us as individuals rely on, but news services rely on as well. They will take stories from social media, pick up and run with it. But when we talk about disinformation or misinformation, we have to ask, what's the intent? Are we intending to deceive someone when we share something? or? Do we believe what we've been shown and then are sharing it, but we're sharing something that is wrong? Or are we taking something that we know is right and then using it in a deceptive manner? All of these things happen. I'm not saying anyone here does it. It's just, a, you know, as, as an example. But it's really about this, what is the intent of when these things happen? And both can be incredibly harmful. Um, you know... We can look at a lot of examples of unintentionally misleading. This is an a, example from uh, during uh, the COVID. Um, we see some really high COVID hotspots here. This is all a breakdown um, of American uh, counties. Um, but what it doesn't show is these are absolute numbers. So, well, which are the high population areas? Are they the most affected? Well, wouldn't it be better to show cases per thousand or cases per hundred, the actual case rates rather than absolute value. So it can be quite misleading in what the potential risk or effect is in, in an area. We can then look at 
other things. This is a, a wildfire location map. And, you know, it makes the earth look like it is literally on fire everywhere all the time. This was used in uh, an article talking about um, fires within um, the, uh, the uh, Amazon rainforest and the intentional burning and things like that. Maps like this, which uh, is it's actually a probability map or risk map showing areas which are potentially affected by fire, but the actual areas are blobs and it's, it, it's one of these things, it's, it's, it's a fright map. It's meant to make you afraid. Is it used well? I don't think so. Could it be done better? Absolutely. Has it been done better? Definitely. But it made media and it spread throughout other parts of the media. I mean, I, I actually picked it up through an article talking about why you should be sus suspicious or sceptical of maps like this. And, s and I'll uh, touch on that again a little bit later. Now, people who make these maps <laughs> and, and misinformation, um, you know, governments do it, political parties do it, corporations do it, corporations particularly through astroturfing organisations, you know, fronts where, you know, they're, they're basically pushing, pushing an agenda um, towards that will make them more money, fair enough. Well, that's, you know, news outlets do it through competence or incompetence and potentially, you know, just uh, circulating inf uh, incorrect information from other locations. Um, you know, obviously special interest groups and action groups and the uh, individuals often conspiracy theorists. Now, misinformation, disinformation doesn't have to be well done, as in this case. I mean, it's pretty obvious, you know, Sharpie Gate, that that's not really part of the map. But trying to mislead or deceive people that it is, is a real problem. And then you can look at, you know, less uh, competently done things, such as, you know, that outback steakhouses are satanic. <laughs> and that they, uh, you know, sh show this, you know, oh my God, it's, it's a pentagram. Oh, well, except for that little outback steakhouse up there that doesn't actually fit in the <laughs> in, in there. Oh, don't, yeah, we'll just ignore that for the moment. But people will see, what's the first thing people will see? They'll see the pentagram. They won't necessarily be looking at the other points. And, you know, you could draw all sorts of, you could probably draw a unicorn using that, um, those five points as well, but these people haven't. They're using it to convey a message which is just, well, frankly, a bit loony. Um, but some people will believe it. So it's like, well, would you spread that? Probably not, but some people do, and some people sadly would believe that's correct. Now, you know, is that a, is that a bad actor or someone just trolling? You, you really don't know the intent, but, you know. Now, in terms of governments, I'm not saying the next few slides are quite political, so I'm going to try and remain as neutral as possible. So this is the new map of China. Uh, published 2023. It has changed since the previous map. The, uh, it doesn't really show up too well, but the nine dash line there is now a 10 dash line. Uh, it's changed. The, the showing the nine dash line got Barbie banned in, in, in Vietnam because the Vietnamese government didn't agree with the borders it represented. And the people who, who made Barbie said, well, well, Chinese is a bigger market, so we're not going to change it. Sorry, guys. Um, we're just going to go where the money is. But there are subtle changes within this map that most people don't notice, it's particularly just up here in the corner where they have a border with Russia. So we see this little bit here around the Amur River uh, up near Karabovsk. And it's a little bit bright. You can't... R it doesn't show up... Oh, oh doesn't show up as well, but this little part here, this little extension, they've actually extended their borders. It's used to cut across an island. It is now completely in enclosing it. And where the city of Karabovsk in Russia was a couple of k's away from uh, the border, it no longer is. So the Chinese have unilaterally changed that. Whether the Russians recognise that, that's a different factor. Whether they've done a deal, who knows. But if you're Russian, you'd say, no, that map's wrong. If you're Chinese, you'll say it's right. Which one is right? Is it misinformation, disinformation, malinformation? Um, it's certainly a political issue. And we have to understand these things that a small change in, in a line on a map can cause a lot of problems. You know, 
Other examples might be the, the naming conventions, Persian Gulf versus Arabian Gulf. This has been a massive, massive issue, you know, um, since, you know, for quite a while now, um, particularly in relation to the rise of certain, you know, politi political and religious um, uh, schools of thought and, uh, you know, the rise of pan-Arabism, the, the increasing rivalry between um, Iran and Saudi Arabia and the, the other Gulf states. What they've done is taken this, what looked to be a wonderful old map, and... Uh, remove the word Persia, so it's just the Gulf. They have literally, you know, taken out the old uh, Microsoft Paint and uh, scrubbed it out. But it's done purely for a political purpose because they don't want it called the Persian Gulf. The, the, the thing being this is, this is, the original map is, is located in the, in the UAE, and so causing it, calling it the Persian Gulf would be politically unacceptable to do so, they have they have they have changed the world. Um, we'll, I won't go too uh, too deep into uh, some of the other implications of that, but how we use names is incredibly powerful as part of how people tell the stories. Whether it's about inf uh, disinformation or it's about misinformation, these are, these are tools that people use. Now, the greatest part of the tool is how this type of information diffuses it diffuses very, very, very quickly. You know, maps, as I said, they're a, they're a great format uh, for spreading mis <coughs> misinformation. They're stories. We believe maps. You know, every, you know, you see stories of, oh, yeah, I believe Google Maps and have had an accident. I've driven off a bridge or, you know, the, the road doesn't exist anymore. We believe maps. Maps tell us the truth. That's what we're in, indoctrinated to think. They do, but only maybe for a given value of truth. You know, social media has become the single biggest method of dissemination of this of these things. So you know, you can see all these green dots, which are Gab. You know, Brown is Telegram. You got Twitter, uh, Twitter up here, various other ones. So they won't stick to just one channel because people never consume social media on one channel. It diffuses through the whole ecosystem from one channel to another to another. One of the important things is that this amplification is mostly at the ex political extremes, right and left. It doesn't matter. I mean, we've got an example here of um, uh, right-wing Russian propaganda because that's the one that's most that shows up mostly in the literature because that's the most well-known and the Russians are well-known for it and using these tools and they're very, very, very effective at it. Um, you know. We can look at uh, some of these real-life examples. Um, many of you may have seen this map on Twitter. It you know, was uh, done by a guy who was creating a graph of a year's worth of bushfires in Australia. It was posted during a bushfire season by someone saying, this is what Australia looks like now from a satellite. Absolute lie. <laughs> you know, if you knew what you were looking at, you, you would say that. But if you didn't, if you're an average person, you know, what are you going to think? Oh, my God, you know, it's, it's, it's the end of the world. You're seeing all this bad stuff on, on the news and you see this in, in your Twitter or Facebook feed. It really influences how you think, how you perceive these things. Then we have, you know, can anyone, rec does anyone recognise this city? Anyone? Sorry? Seattle, and Beijing. It's actually a fusion. This, this is one of the biggest risks that people are seeing in geospatial misinformation, a disinformation, is the use of generative AI as a tool, a threat to map making, particularly the use of fake sat or deep fake satellite imagery. So you take, that's, that's what that was, it was a deep fake satellite image. Um, and they're using what's called uh, generational adversarial networks. So they're, they're going backwards and forwards and building up these tools to make it as fake as possible but look really real. Now, there's some stats here. You know, 70% of people, uh, uh, you know, uh, have, have, have shared something. Uh, it's, it's more likely, 70% more likely to share um, 
fake news than real news, and 44% admit, admit to being fooled by it. Well, I'm sure 56% of people are just keeping quiet on that. <laughs> but ultimately, the only way to really um, not share these things is to be sceptical, you know. Look at the source, you know, look at the authors. Are they credible, you know? Is the title clickbaity? Is it different from the content, you know? If it makes you react emotionally, Think about why it's doing that. What does it want you to do? You know, misinformation and disinformation is a virus. It wants to spread. People want you to spread it. And these really are these sorts of things. So when we're looking at, you know, creating information, and there can be, you know, don't get me wrong, huge amount of public good for it, just be aware that there can be people who will take this information and use it to misinform and harm others. So it's something we really all need to be aware of. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. That was a really interesting and a whole bunch of great examples there. Uh, I think critical thinking is a really important <laughs> skill that uh, maybe some lacking in some places. Uh, questions from the audience? No questions? Sure. Well... Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> <laughs>